What happened to Florida State? And more importantly, what will happen to Florida State? Next on Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. All right, everyone, we're steamrolling toward the opener here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, and finally getting to our 2019 season previews. All right, so we've set up this season in every conceivable way with recruiting updates and position preview, schedule rankings, and more than that, conference breakdowns and everything that you see with the 8,000 videos that we posted total. But now I get to my season previews. Not predictions. I hold out on those. I know. I just can't pull the trigger until the season almost is underway. But it paid off last year as I picked Clemson to win the national championship. What about the team that last was able to knock off Clemson in the ACC? The team not on the field for one game, Pitt, Syracuse, but the team that was last king of the ACC before Clemson. Florida State, 5-7 and seven last year. Three and five in the ACC. Of course, before we continue with the Knowles, grab the Amazon link in the description section below to help us build the channel. And of course, lock it in right here with the likes, the comments, share the videos, and subscribe right here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. All right. This team that was on the field for 2018 was the worst Florida State football team since 1976. The worst offense since 1975. That was the year before Bobby Bowden started. Uh, according to the advanced metrics, not the flat-out uh, yards per game, scoring average per game, but the advanced metrics, Florida State ranked 124th in the nation in offense out of 130 teams. What happened to this program? They won a national championship in 2013. They're sitting on the best talent in the nation in Florida. They have a great brand, a great tradition. They, even as recent as 2016, won the Orange Bowl over Michigan and finished in the top 10 in the country. To open 2017, they were highly regarded enough to be number three in the nation before DeAndre Francois was lost against Alabama. They lost to the Crimson Tide 24-7. James Blackman came in, and to his credit, he stayed upright and stayed healthy the whole season before uh, taking a beating and a battering the entire season as a true freshman. And then it all went downhill. Now, many people believe that Jimbo Fisher just flat out quit once his quarterback went down and he lost that first game against Alabama and things soured from there. And he quit and then he officially quit, of course, after the season and that seven and six campaign. The offensive line, despite the recruiting rankings, and we'll run them down in just a second, and they stack up very favorably against Clemson. Now, we haven't seen it on the field manifest itself in the last two seasons, but statistically, the recruiting is just as good as Clemson, and it was better than Clemson as Clemson was taking them over. But what's the most important unit on the field? It's offensive line, the most important position, quarterback, most important unit, I would say offensive line. And Florida State missed on some prospects there more than any other unit and also neglected the offensive line. So even though the recruiting rankings were good, the recruiting approach was nothing close to what we see at Georgia and Alabama and most importantly for Florida State in comparison with what Clemson does. And not just hitting the recruiting rankings and hitting all the stars and bringing in the talent, but building a roster that makes sense. Florida State started to fail in that area. Despite recruiting rankings starting in 2016, so we're looking at the recruiting rankings that produce the roster right now, number one in the ACC in 2016, number three in the nation. 2017, 2017, as recent as 2017, they still had the top-ranked class in the Atlantic Coast Conference, number six in the country. In 2018, number three in the ACC, number 11 in college football. In 2019, the class that's going to play on the field as freshmen this year, except for the kids that redshirt, number two in the ACC and number 19 in the country, and then the recruiting class for 2020 that they're still working on is number three in the ACC and number 13 in college football. So is Willie Taggart to blame for what happened last year? Well, he's responsible. It's his program. He's got his name on the door that leads to the office of the head coach. He's to blame. 
well, Jimbo Fisher didn't put him in the best position, but he still gave him a lot of talent. But uh, the program, the vibe, the feel wasn't in a great place at that time. And again, even though the recruiting rankings tell us it was a near elite roster, it was uh, not recruited well. The approach was not great. So Willie Taggart, yes, he's to blame, especially since his team, sure, they came out like garbage against Tech's, uh, Virginia Tech in losing 24-3, to and the offense right out of the gate was awful and never got better. But by the end of the season, in Week 12 against Florida, they were still committing careless penalties, still couldn't line up right. Uh, he just never brought discipline and focus to this team. We'll see if he can do it this year. Yes, he turned around Western Kentucky. He turned around South Florida. This is Florida State. I think I could stand on the sideline and go 7-5 and five for Florida State. They were just unprepared. They were just they they just didn't lose. So Jimbo Fisher only went seven and six the year before, but check out the effort. Check out the results on the field. Jimbo Fisher only went seven and six, six and six. You could say before he quit and they won the bowl game, but they were in every game. They they practically still looked like Florida State. They only lost to Clemson uh, in a game that they were driving for the lead score with four or five minutes left in the game. They were barely losing games. They had to play Alabama non-conference, and that game was 10-7 to in the second half. This team was abysmal against almost everyone. Uh, they barely beat Louisville. Louisville had to hand them the game, and Louisville was one of the worst teams in the Power Five. They only scored three points against Virginia Tech, and Virginia Tech gave up points to everybody. They were awful. They only played three decent games the whole year against Miami, Wake Forest, and Boston College. All right. So along with Willie Taggart, he rid the staff. And obviously the one uh, coaching staff change that's getting the most pub is Kendall Bryles coming in as offensive coordinator. So Willie Taggart's supposed to be an offensive coach. But now he's turned over the offense to Kendall Bryles, who pretty much implements the same type of concepts, spread them out, find the mismatch, up-tempo type of concepts. It minimizes the weaknesses along the offensive line. I also wanted to point out as, as I approach these, uh, these previews, this series of previews, is I'm also looking at, at the trajectory of the program. So we looked at the recruiting rankings and what played into that, but also the records. Of course, five and seven, three and five in the ACC last year, seven and six in Jimbo's last year, three and five in the ACC. Then before that, of course, they were really good. Ten and three, five and three in the ACC in 2016 when they won the Orange Bowl. And then in 2015, they went 10 and three, six and two in the ACC. That was the year that they went and played in the Peach Bowl and lost to Houston. Uh, 32 and 19. A very uneven 32-19, and 19, like a top-10 program, and then suddenly like a ranked 60 program. 32-19, uh, and 17-15, and 15, these four seasons in the ACC. All right, the offense uh, was abysmal again in 2018. They started nine different line combinations. Uh, the offensive line's been overhauled again here for 2019. Ryan Roberts comes in as a really good player from Northern Illinois. He's going to get his playing time. They've got a top 10 guard recruit in uh, Dante Lucas. He'll probably be forced into action. Again, we mentioned Kendall Bryles' offense. Well, just check out his results thus far. Okay, he's been at Baylor, FAU, and Houston. Look at the offensive rankings for those teams before he got there. Then where he took them, and then what happened after he left. Uh, and the pattern is set. you got to give it up for the guy. He knows how to coach offensive football, so he can scheme it up. James Blackman, 58% passer two years ago in 2017 when he was forced into action as a freshman, so credit him for surviving that season and still throwing 19 touchdowns against just 11 interceptions. He was beat up, and he was a beanpole at the time. He's gained a little bit of weight. He only played the four games last year to keep his red shirt. Five touchdowns, one pick against uh, the the uh, the competition in the four games, and he really ripped up NC State as uh, Florida State almost pulled off the upset. The burner out of the group of wide receivers is uh, Tamarian Terry, 21 yards per catch. He was only a freshman last year. DJ Matthews had 42 catches. Keith Gavin, 26 catches. He was a big recruit, very capable. 
So the wide receiver core is really good, and they've got a tight end that they like in Trey McKitty, who caught 26 passes as well. They only have four running backs on the roster. Most teams have seven or eight. They have four. Now, I understand they want to throw the football, but still. Cam Akers, obviously was recruited and signed to be the offense, the running back. Well, he's playing in a different offense now. So he's going to have to adapt. He's going to have to play uh, running back out of the backfield and swing out and catch the football. Uh, Kalen Laburn was the number one all-purpose back out of high school, and he was hurt last season in 2017. We'll see what he has, but they need him. Defensively for Florida State, they're good. They've got talent, of course, but they're not Florida State good. This is not vintage Florida State. They gave up 30 touchdown passes last year. That was the fifth worst mark in FBS play. They do have eight of their 10 top tacklers back from 2018, but nobody replaces Brian Burns. I don't see any player on the roster that's capable of replacing him, although a lot of people like Marvin Wilson. He was a five-star who cleaned up with 42 total tackles, but he's a different type of player. He plays on the inside at defensive tackle, and he's already had some knee issues. The linebacking play has been down, but a lot of Florida State insiders that I talk to, the people that I have on my show, and then the other ones that I I read and follow say that the linebackers are going to be in better shape than they've been in the last few years. Uh, And the coaching staff is talking that up as well. You got uh, Hansa Nasirildin, Playing safety slash linebacker. Uh, He's basically a safety. He's listed as a safety, but he comes down and plays in the box quite frequently. 91 tackles. Dontavious Jackson had 75 tackles. So they've got players coming back with productivity at linebacker. Both cornerbacks are back. Stanford Samuels the third, and also Asante Samuel. You've got a safety in Levante Taylor who has tremendous potential. He was a high four-star had two interceptions in the finale two years ago against Florida, and uh, he's a really good player. And, of course, Jaden Lars Woodby uh, was one of the top recruits in college football, Uh, almost went to USC, went to Florida State, almost went to Ohio State, chose Florida State. Maybe he's sorry that he did, but he's a top talent, and he will be a force in the secondary again this season. All right. Place kicker Ricky Aguayo hit on only 11 of 17 kicks last year, but he was an 85% kicker in 2017, so he's capable. The coverage and return units were horrible. Florida State had the worst field position difference of almost 10 yards difference in the nation, worst in FBS play. They gave up field, pers- uh, they gave up field position per possession of 10 yards, minus 10 yards per possession. All right. Uh, yes, that's got to get fixed. You got Mark Snyder coming in as special teams coach, and uh, he coached the special teams at Michigan State from 2015 to 17. They were really good, especially when Michigan just handed them the football and a game-winning touchdown at the big house, of course. All right, a lot of talent, but a lot to fix on this offense and the defense as well, but especially the offense has to get better. Uh, Despite all these athletes and despite the recruiting rankings I went through, there are really no exceptional units on this team. There are no units that you could say that is a great wide receiver core. It's a really good wide receiver core and probably the best unit on the offense The secondary is really good, but again, not great. They gave up 30 touchdowns last year, Uh, but those are probably the two best units on the field, the wide receivers and the secondary, and then the linebackers. The offensive line is awful. The defensive line is thin. The running backs are good. Well, they've got one for sure. So again, running back issues in terms of depth, certainly, and maybe in terms of fit with Cam Akers in this offense, offensive line issues continue until they show us that they can block people up front. All right, Willie Taggart, he turned around the two group of five programs. Can he do it at Florida State? Well, again, he's got the talent and he's brought in the talent despite the five and seven and the lack of proof of concept. 
Uh, he's recruiting rather well for 2019 and going into 2020 and 2021. We will, of course, have our Florida State prediction before the season starts. The big whiteboard with all the teams in the country, or however we're going to do it. Uh, but I can't pull the trigger right now on Florida State. I'm leaning 8-4. and four. That's what they look at. That's what they look like right now, right here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. We will see you next time with another season preview.